Welcome back to another edition of Next Up with Nick Gismondi. This is another fun one for me. I get to bring in a friend and fellow journalist, Leif Sheriffs, everybody. Leif, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, Nick. Great to see you. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed following you this year, by the way, because the Blackhawks, they are my favorite team. They have been for a number of years. I grew up in Milwaukee, so they were the nearest NHL team. So I'm glad you landed with a great franchise. Oh, well, thanks very much. Uh, we, 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 we got to get you out to a game then, clearly. <laughs> I think the last game I was at Blackhawks uh, Stadium, I, I think might have been the Stanley Cup against Philly, I, I believe. But it was uh, it was a great experience. Always is when you're at the, the stadium. Well, Leif, you obviously are a professional, former professional tennis player. Now you're a broadcaster, uh, journalist of the sport. Let's go back to the beginning a little bit with you. Uh, for, for me, I, I, I've always loved the athletes, and I've known a few of them that make that jump from covering the sport uh, or playing the sport and then jumping into the, the journalistic side of it. Uh, f- for you, what, what, what was the impetus on that? Was it just the continuous love of the game and you wanted to find a way to carry that through? I, I think there was a little bit of that. I think there was a little bit of good luck, a little bit of good fortune. Uh, I humorously say that uh, because I was available on the weekend, you know, I didn't make it to the weekend. I wasn't playing for a trophy that I was available to do my first gig for the semifinals and finals of event in Stowe, Vermont. So uh, being available was one of my strongest, uh, you know, resources at that time. But, you know, that got me in the chair. I worked along Bruce Beck, a you know, legendary New York uh, journalist and sportscaster. So, you know, I, I was grounded with some good people around me and that helped me get a, a start. Let's go back to to the playing career, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the journalistic side of things. Uh, you you played for a long while. You had success. What was it? What was it like being being a tennis player back in in your time to see sort of kind of how it's maybe evolved even until now, from then till now? Yeah, you know, I I feel like I you know had a relationship with some of the golden arrows in the game. You know, Jimmy Connors, Bjorn Borg, and John McEnroe. They were sort of, uh, when I was just turning pro, finishing college and getting into the pros, I was still playing some of the lower uh, ranks at that time. But I did get a break through in 82, 83 is when I started playing more full-time. Borg was obviously gone by then, but still it was Connors, McEnroe, Lendl. And then by the end of my career, you had young players like Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi coming into the game. So I think I was able to bridge a really interesting time in the game. So I was very fortunate to be a part of it. You know, I was a good player, and on a good day, I could be very dangerous. Uh, you know, plate, I could pressure on some guys. So, um, you know, I got a few good wins, and I think if you can be consistent over a period of time on the tour, uh, you'll get a chance to, to pull off a few good wins. You know, maybe get an Yvonne Lendl when he's not his best, like I did at Queens, or I got Pete Sampras uh, before he won the U.S. Open, about, I want to say, just under a year ahead of his first U.S. Open win. So, it was probably a loss that motivated Pete to go on to bigger and better things. I'll say that, but uh, the tour, it was, it was an absolute pleasure. You love every minute of it, despite the, the challenges and the hardships, but uh, it's a time I'll never forget. Being a professional in any sport, I think has, you know, a great deal of difficulty that people don't always necessarily see. I think from the outside looking in, people say, okay, well, that person is talented. They obviously have a natural gift and then they worked hard at something and that's what got them there. But Tell me about your journey to becoming a professional tennis player. Was it a lot of innate ability or was it the grind and that hard work that we don't always see that put you where you were? Yeah, I think if you're going to have success in anything, you definitely need to work hard. And on the pro tour, that's essential. I think I was in an era just when Yvonne Lendl was coming in where more and more players were training in the gym, doing a lot of road work, becoming bigger, stronger, faster athletes. So uh, you had to put in that time, no doubt about that. Um, you know, there is a grind element to it because it's not all champagne and roses. You know, there are a lot of times when you've got losing streaks and you're having to deal with loneliness on the tour. You know, the fact that I met my wife and was able to, you know, travel with her, that helped give me a little bit of a backbone on the tour and give me some support. So I think emotionally off court, that can help you on court. And I think that works for a lot of players. Uh, It worked for me. Um, but yeah, there are challenges that make it inherently tough. I mean, for me, coming out of Wisconsin, I was sort of a little insecure about my tennis because there were so many great players, you know, California kids and Florida kids uh, who seem to have more experience and, you know, maybe a, a little deeper experience developing in the sport. You know, I played 
volleyball and basketball and tennis in high school. So I didn't really play full time till I was about uh, 18. So, uh, you know, I did, had a lot of catching up to do, but I think I did that. And maybe I matured a little bit later in my mid twenties when I was really playing my best tennis. You mentioned something earlier. I think it's kind of been the trend in, in sports that weren't typically thought of as, you know, the super strong buff, you know, ripped athlete. I think golf was that way. Tennis was a little bit that way. And then it sort of changed. Everybody realized, okay, well, if I get the gym and I get a little bit fitter and I get a little bit faster and I get a little bit stronger, it's going to give me that big edge. I mean, you, you watch some old time golf and, and those guys weren't the, the, the nowadays typical, you know, fit golfer that you see. Same with tennis. Everybody's got you know, the shirts fit a little tighter. You're looking a little stronger. Everything's buffed up a little bit. Was that a weird transition for you when it was that realization that, oh, wait, if I get into the gym, I can enhance things, my, my endurance, my physicality. And, and did, did you embrace that with everybody else? I think you had to, to some degree. You know, it was all around you. You saw guys in the locker room. They were getting more buff. They were getting stronger and faster. And I think we're seeing now the evolution of the tennis athlete and it's leaner, stronger, faster. I mean, you have to have some element of speed. You want to be strong, yet you also want to be lightweight. You know, look at Novak Djokovic. I mean, the guy looks, you know, 165 dripping wet, yet he can run all day and he's strong enough to play. I mean, Roger Federer, lean and mean. So these guys are finding a way to build strength, but also speed and agility and quickness. I think those assets are indispensable on a tennis court. Because there used to be a time when, boy, you were 6'6 six, six to 6'10, six, but you couldn't play tennis. Now you've got these big guys who are tremendous athletes playing tennis with the agility. Uh, you know, a lot of the athleticism you might see on a basketball court is now you're seeing that on a tennis court. So the game's gotten taller, stronger, faster, but it's also leaner and meaner. So uh, it was definitely something you had to embrace. Uh, I got it early on in my career, and I think the tour has only gotten more and more physical and, and more and more demanding in that regard. I think you constantly see evolution in sport. Where, where, what is the next evolution, in, in your opinion, for where tennis is going, especially right now in these times that we're living in at the moment? Yeah, you know, it, these are unfortunate times for everyone. And as sport, we obviously want all those times back. Um, you know, the way the game is played now is so different from when we played, you know, the 80s and into the 90s was starting to change. I mean, the rackets and the strings have allowed players to hit the ball so consistently hard that you can get to be pretty good pretty quickly. I mean, you look at the juniors and you'll get some of the challenger level players. They play at a pretty high level in terms of stroke production for the back of the court. Movement is incredible. So the game is tougher and tougher to break into because there's so much talent out there. Uh, you just wonder whether the next phase in the game, will we get away from you know two guys firing rockets from the back of the court? Will we see more all around tennis? Will we see a little more of the Roger Federer influence? We certainly see Nadal getting to the net more occasionally as he gets older. And even Novak is making forays in the net. So I tend to feel like maybe we'll see a little more all-court tennis that guys have to come in a little bit more to find a way to finish because everyone's so good from the back of the court that you just have to add a little, a few more layers, a few more dimensions to your game. You played world team tennis as well in your career as a player. Now you're part of it from the broadcasting side of things amongst many other things in the tennis world. You become a face synonymous with the sport in terms of reporting on it. Do you, do you enjoy that side of it? Do you enjoy getting to talk about it and analyze it and break it down? And maybe, maybe what is it about that side of this new tennis career that you've taken on after playing? Do you like the most? Well, I, it's obviously a chance to stay connected to a sport we've you know made a part of our lives. So I think I'm very fortunate in that regard. Uh, the fact that I'm witness to history unfolding before our eyes, these great players, men and women, um, you know, setting a new standard for tennis. So we're growing with the game and just to be able to report on that and hopefully in some small way shape the direction of our game, shape the fans who watch the game uh, and maybe share the same passion we do. So we want to try and get it right, you know, be informative, uh, be interested and continue this love affair with tennis. So uh, it's great to be back. We're in world team tennis as well. I've been with Billie Jean for so many years and now I'm with the uh, our new CEO who we're enjoying so much. So I feel like, you know, world team tennis continues to grow as well. And it's fun to be a part of that. Do you find yourself, and I find myself doing this, like any sport that I played that I then announced or broadcasted or wrote about or whatnot, 
I find that I watch it differently. Do you, do you find that you watch the game of tennis differently as a broadcaster than you did when you were a player or on the sidelines or as a fan? Yeah, well, as a player, I used to watch the players. In fact, I feel like that's how I sort of learned the game. You know, I wanted to hit my backhand like you know, Guillermo Vilas. I wanted to serve and volley like John Macron. I wanted to play with the intensity of Jimmy Connors, maybe have that style of Edith Gerolaita. So, I mean, I watched the game for a different reason. Uh, now, when I watch the game, I'm also listening. You know, I'm listening to what the broadcasters have to say. What's, what's the takeaway? Are, are they telling the story you know, that's happening inside the game? And Jimmy always said, you know, it's the game within the game. Can we can we get a sense of what that is? And so I tend to listen to the broadcasters a bit more, whether it's maybe even not tennis. It could be football. And I like to listen to the ins and outs. So I'm sure you do as well. We want to listen to our craft and learn and hopefully improve. Like anything, you have to keep improving. And so, again, share the passion, hopefully learn as we go. What an occasion this is. 25 years as an ATP World Tour event. That is remarkable. Looking ahead uh, this year, World Team Tennis, uh, how do you see this season playing out? You've got the Springfield Lasers coming in on back-to-back -back championships. They still look strong. Uh, the addition of a new team in the Chicago Smash coming into the league. So adding another dynamic to an already very dynamic and growing World Team Tennis organization, how does this year play out in 2020? You know, I think it's an exciting time, and uh, obviously everyone's moving forward with care. Obviously, the concern has to be for the health and welfare of all of us, players and people involved. And I'm sure we're seeing the developments in Major League Baseball. They're trying to move forward uh, sort of a plan of action if to get their season going. And we've seen that in golf and some of these other sports. I mean, I think tennis is a pretty good sport for these difficult times. There is a fair amount of separation. Obviously, I think you have to have care with doubles and how we get it all together but i think tennis and the fact that it, it is in july and late july i think it's a wonderful opportunity for players to get you know back involved in the sport you know if we can do it safely i think you're going to see a number of top players getting involved because it's a chance for them to get out and play some matches that are meaningful and a chance for them to get back and earn a living again you know all of us i think want to get back working we want to have that sort of satisfaction. But for a lot of these players, too, you want to have you know financial success. You want to continue at your job and hopefully have an opportunity to do that. I, I think uh, World Team Tennis is moving in the right direction. I'm hoping that they can do it. What are you hearing from other maybe players or leaders in the sport of tennis in terms of where everything else is going? I know we've we've seen some cancellations and we've seen some postponements and whatnot, but what's the general sense you're getting in the tennis world as to how they're going to move forward, be it tour, be it players, et cetera? Yeah, I have had uh, conversations with a number of players, and I think everyone is moving forward, but you know, with care. Uh, I think there is an eagerness to try and make things happen. Obviously, the tours have moved now to August when they might consider getting back into tournament tennis again. And again, you know, the fact that you know, Tennis Channel had their reopen event, they're going to have a women's event later this week. So I, I think that they're making these steps to try to get an understanding of how can our sports survive in these changing circumstances. Um, obviously, the consideration, you know, we have to be respectful to everyone who is still facing the challenges. Uh, of this pandemic. And uh, I think we have to consider that. But again, if we can do this with care, if we can protect the players and the officials and, and make it happen, I, I think it's valuable for all of us that we have something to turn to, something to inspire us. So hopefully in all sports, we're going to see those steps taken gradually and safely to get it going again, right? Nick, we want to see sports and we want to be inspired by us. Buddy, from your lips to God's ears, I am ready to go. I very much enjoy doing things like this and having Zoom meetings and, and interviews and conferences, but I miss the I miss standing next to a legend like you and holding the microphone and being on a broadcast and, uh, and you're talking too about kind. sports. You're too, kind. <laughs> you're too kind. I think, you know, hey, listen, we're all sports fans, but, you know, we love our world, too. We want to make sure it's right, and uh, I think we've got a great future ahead of us despite the challenges. All right, before I let you go, what have you been doing during quarantine? Have you been have you been having any fun? Are you a Netflix guy? Like what have you been? Are you watching? Yeah. You're watching any shows? Like what what's Leaf doing during this time of isolation? <laughs> uh, we've been burning up Netflix pretty good. We you know, I figured the clay court season is coming up, so we did watch um uh, a couple of shows uh 
we watched, uh, well, they were the French related. We watched Versailles, the three season series. That was quite good about Louis yeah. the 14th. So that had a little clay court resonance, I felt. And um, we, we getting outside, we do have a bike path near our house. We're able to get out and do some bikes, yeah. go for swims. Uh, so we're trying to stay active, but, uh, you know, just reading books, trying to keep in touch with people as best we can to, to see how the world's going. And, uh, you know, like everyone, I think we're all looking forward to good things happening down the road. It's just, you know, hey, we're trying to be as patient as we can, but and having fun while we're doing it. It's it's not easy. Probably eating and drinking too much, too. But that that goes with being in the house for so long. Well, maybe, maybe later on this week, you and me can have a have a Zoom happy hour and we can, <laughs> we can talk about the uh, we can talk about the upcoming season. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know one thing we've been doing is we've been ordering these meals in. So I feel like I'm becoming something of a chef these days. I mean, when I was at college, I worked in the grill serving hamburgers and cheeseburgers. So I've expanded now to proper meals. But so Marie and I have been making meals in the evening. So it's a wonderful way to, you know, sort of have a date at home and, and do something special. I'm like this. Uh, I'm like this really fun mix, at least in my mind, when I'm alone in my house, of uh, of Gordon Ramsay and then uh, Tom Cruise's uh, character in Cocktail. <laughs> I feel like that's what I've become now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you're flipping the knives in one hand and then the shaker in the other. Right, right. <laughs> I love it, Leaf. And I'm getting you out to Chicago. You're going to see a Hawks game next season. You come out. You're guesting me. We'll have some fun in Chi Town. How about beers with Taze and Kane? Can we do that, or is that going to be too tough to ask? I'm pretty sure we can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem at all. For you, anything. You're Leaf Shirt. Uh, all right, man. Hey, thanks. Thanks for including me. Hey, great chatting with you. Stay safe. Looking forward to getting back to action and being alongside you again, partner. That's Leaf Sheriff, ladies and gentlemen. Former, obviously, professional tennis player and a man who needs no introduction. Uh, an incredible broadcaster on both the Tennis Channel and with us on CBS at World Team Tennis. Uh, that's it for this week's edition of Next Up with Nick Gizmondi. We'll see you again next week for another all-new episode.